Once again, we, we want to continue. And our objective is that by the end of this, as students, you will be able to tell yourself what student deliberation is all about as a method of teaching. You should also be able to itemize clearly those types that come under self deliberation, student deliberation, student deliberation as an organized method of teaching. And we have said before we went away that we have class discussion where we have a whole class and the teacher is in control and allows questions from learners. The, the teacher responds to the questions that these learners ask. And so we say that it is teacher control. The teacher is in control. We go to seminar. I mentioned it the other time and I said it takes various forms, but it, ha it has a main feature. And the main feature is that the group members, in our case, the students themselves, are in control over the course and the content of the material in a seminar. That's the difference between class discussion and seminar as a method of teaching. Seminars, usually, they are based or they are organized around an essay type or a paper that can be presented by one of the students. You have given an assignment to a student to find out issues. If, you, if we, there was a debate and a student found information concerning the con or the pro area and we asked that student to come and present that, you can use that presentation as a point of reference for a seminar. It could also take the form of a fish bowl technique. Fish bowl. I'll explain that. What is that? The meaning of this fish bowl technique is that we have two circles. We have an inner circle. And then the inner circle is going to be involved in the discussions. Then behind this inner circle, there's another session, a circle that is looking at without being part of what is being presented. It is after the presentation that a forum, the two groups come together and a discussion comes out. If this is done, we are saying that you are using a seminar approach methodology to teach. Another approach for organizing a seminar is done through brain, brainstorming. So many times my students will say, I will, do, I will use brainstorm or brainstorming to teach. They just write that and that is all. So when I'm marking such a notes that has been prepared, I ask, how, through what are you brainstorming? How are you going to do the brainstorming? So mark it. If you are brainstorming, you should do something. In this approach, the group members are going to engage themselves in noting down points suggestions towards the solution of a problem so what do you as a teacher do to help them to note down points to note down suggestions so you must write leading questions for them cue them help them to note down these points and you, if you were preparing in some lesson notes on this, you have to show in the teacher-learner activity what you, the teacher, plans to do 
in order to find a learner response examples of which you have to give in your lesson plan all right there's also group tutorial that you can use to teach a session of the class in this case tackles a problem and this problem is course related so that, that is why I have told you some time ago that you need to get copies of your syllabus in your subject area because it is course related. Tax are set in your syllabuses or syllabi. And so the teacher looks at that and picks these topics. And then the students are set to work and the teacher guide them when help is needed. There's another form as problem solving, problem raising tutorial. Here the class has opportunity to ask for explanations. I remember also this at the university. You are lecturer, the whole class is divided and say five students are assigned to a lecturer and this lecturer draws a timetable for these five students to meet him or her at his or her office that lecturer is not the one who teaches that topic or that course but the students meet him or her in his office or her office for further explanations of the things that they do not understand in the course that they are taking. So I remember in literature, for example, I was taking literature and I was given a tutorial lecture. I had to meet him by the timetable he has drawn. And he would take me through those things that the lecturer in that course had taken me through and which I have found to be difficult or not to understand, did not underst understand, and then he will take me through and explain them. That is tutorials, and we can do same with our students. We have group projects. I have explained it the other time. Students carry out small projects in small groups, and whether you like it or not. By the time you are, you are finishing Valley View, you would have done a project. Now, all this comes for us to understand that we can divide teaching methods into two broad ones. We have the mass lecture. And then when we come to the individualized, look at the types of methods that we have gone through under the individualized teaching. We want to specifically look at one method, the discussion method. Anytime I'm marking students' notes, they will tell me I will use discussion, I will ask the children to discuss, then I will ask in red pen, ink, how. The discussion method is an aspect of discovery methodology. And discovery is student or learner centered because it's the student who is going to make a discovery. So the teacher using discussion method should remember you are not going to impart the knowledge alone. Discussion method. The word to discuss implies two forms of exchanges. So when you are discussing a thing or a topic, there can be two views. It has to do with that. It is not the only one view. So your view and that of the students come to play. The teacher learns from the students in the discussion. And the same way the students learn from the teacher. That this is what makes it a discussion. So it becomes inter-learning. So don't go for a discussion as a method of teaching. And you, the teacher, you go and stand there and talk and talk and talk and you say you are discussing. 
It is not a discussion in that case. How then do you use discussion method? It involves a greater degree of teacher-learner interaction. Let me repeat it. A greater degree of teacher-learner interaction than the, me the lecture method. So in a discussion, the learners share their views. They contribute to their ideas. And the teacher listens and only facilitates the learning process. If the teacher is facilitating, if you were planning a lesson to use it, then you must show how you are going to facilitate. Are you going to use questions? Are you going to use demonstration to facilitate? You must show that one. So for the for it to be discussion method to be effective, the teacher must design well structured questions. Let me repeat. If you want a discussion session to be effective, then you need to sit and design well structured questions to elicit, to bring out ideas and information from the learner. So if you are using a discussion and look at your teacher learner activity and there are no questions you are asking, you are not discussing anything there. So a discussion method becomes very effective in achieving the objective that you have set when the questions that are to be asked are in the synetic, synectic form or model of teaching. Don't get confused, don't get off. I will explain this to you clearly. Synectics is a model of teaching. And so we are saying that if you are using a discussion method and you want this to be very effective, then you need to know Synetics method of teaching, which is a model developed by Comenius. It is a model of teaching. And it lends itself in creativity. It makes the learner to be very creative. And it is designed through questions with the use of analogy. Analogy. An analogy. I have usually found this very interesting when I'm teaching educational psychology. I use a carpenter. I use the type of woods that the carpenter works with. I use the type of tools that the carpenter uses. And at the end of the day, this is an analogy. We do the interpretation and ask ourselves, why is the teacher like a carpenter? Why should the carpenter work? Or why does he work with so many types of woods? Why does he have different types of tools? And what determines the use of the tools that he has to use? And so you will come to know that if you are identified, the students are the roots, individual differences. We have Wawa, we have Safene, we have Odum. They are not of the same stature. And so if you want to work on Odum, you need to pick a tool that is also heady, teddy, because the width of that wood is, is strong. Similarly, in the classroom, we have the Doom children, we have the Sapele children, we have the Wawa also. I think you'll agree with me. So this is an analogy. Now, Comenius came out with the following analogy. His analogy on education says, the child is likened to a seed, the child, the learner. The curriculum is the soil where the seed, the child, can be sown. 
And then your teaching method is the nature. The teaching method nurtures the seed. The seed is in the soil, the child. The child is to, to be nurtured. But what is the soil for the child in the school? The soil in the school is the curriculum, your syllabus. Now, how do you nurture the child, the seed, in the soil using the curriculum? And Comenio says that it is your teaching method, the method that you choose that will nurture the child. Very interesting. And if you take them one after the other, you see how it is. In order to make, therefore, your discussion effective, you, the teacher, like I said in my educational psychology class, I use the carpenter and the wood and the tools. You need to sit down and develop your own analogy. And this takes initiative. So you make it the focus of the class for discussion and presentation using your analogy. Now, alongside your prepared analogy, you write down thought provoking questions. You remember I just asked in my analogy. Why should the carpenter work with so many types of woods? Why should he work with types of tools? These are thought provoking questions. Who is in the education realm? Who is represented by the woods? And how about the two? So these are questions that you need to sit down and write. You could ask, in this analogy of Comenius, why is the child likened to a seed? Remember, the seed has been created by somebody. We believe that God is the creator. And in the Genesis account, he says, let every tree be bring up a seed according to its kind. That's the thing. That is why we have orange, not bearing banana or papaya. According to its kind. And in this seed is a germinating principle. Remember, when we started our course, I, rem I remember presenting and explaining what a principle is. A scientific law that is applicable anywhere. In other words, the seed has a germinating principle that if you put a seed into soil and you provide the necessary environment for it to germinate, the seed will necessarily germinate. So farmers put seeds into the soil, they provide the warmth, the moisture, God provides the sunshine, the heat, and back the seed germinates. So if, if the child is the seed, then the teacher must provide this appropriate environment for the child to grow. And Comenius is saying that in this process we call nurturing. So your methodology, the methodology that you choose must nurture the child. Why do you think a seed grows imperceptibly? When a seed is growing, nobody can see with the eye that, oh, look, the seed is growing, the seed is growing. No. But before you are aware, it has come out, the, 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 the trend, or the young thing, the leaves are coming, imperceptibly it is growing. Why? Are there some components of a seed that we can find in a child? It's a thought-provoking question. And how do farmers nurture a seed? How do parents nurture their children? Why can't plants grow without nurturing? Similarly, why can't students learn without nurturing? These are questions that you need to ask if you want to use Comenius, Comenius analogy in education. So the end result of answering these questions is the development of creativity in the learners. That's why the self-interface, it is self-discovery as a method. So the teacher will find out that the different type of answers that the children have given, the learners have created.
come out. They came out with answers to the questions. And so the answers are their own and not that of the teacher. So what are we emphasizing? Teachers strive to prepare your own analogies. Two, accompany your analogies with thought-provoking questions. If you do this, you will make your lesson presentation very meaningful and successful. No doubt about that. And you go home very happy and glad, satisfied that you, nobody tells you that as for today, you did it. You are happy. It goes with that. If you prepare and you go to teach, there's a self-satisfaction in your soul. Apart from Comenius and his analogy in teaching, we have another method which we call inductive and deductive method of teaching. Inductive methodology. What is it? It is a method of teaching by which the teacher teaches from generalization to particular. You make a generalization in the process, then questions are used to arrive at a generalization. Now, it is therefore we say that it is a process which has a set of data presented. Then after the presentation of the data, learners are asked to draw a conclusion and make a generalization or develop a pattern of relationship from that data. So if you sum up in inductive methodology, we begin with individual specific examples and then we move, secondly, we move to a generalization. In other words, inductive methodology is from particular to general or from simple to complex. And this method of teaching lends itself to the presentation of concepts. You want to teach concepts. So in mathematics, you let your children you look at you on the board. You draw four-sided figures. Draw four-sided figures in their different shapes. The point is that the shapes must all have four sides. And so you have a parallelogram. You have a trapezium, whatever. What is more important is that they should they all have four sides, particular figures. And then the general name will be quadrilateral. Quadrilateral, because a quadrilateral is a four-sided figure. You started from a parallelogram, four-sided. You moved on to another figure, the same four-sided. Move on to another figure, four-sided. They all have four sides, particular, particular. Now, the general is that they are all quite, they can all be called quadrilateral. That is inductive method of teaching. And her twin sister is deductive. It is the opposite of inductive. In the inductive method of teaching, the teacher starts from a principle or a generalization. And from that generalization, we go to a particular. All birds can fly, say generalization. How do we prove this? How do we get to a particular? So I zoom in, then we go to the kingdom of birds. On an excursion, we go to the parrot, the flies, the vulture flies, the what flies, until we go to the ostrich. The ostrich, try as we may, will not fly. So we change our first statement, general statement, because uh, there's a particular thing that we have found. 
and then we can say almost all birds can fly. Deductive thinking includes testing generalizations to see if they will hold in a specific one. So in our generalization, all birds can fly. We were testing that case in the context of individual birds until we came to a bird that cannot fly. So when we are summarizing this afternoon, we want to say that the discussion method is an effective tool to use to carry through to do the following. Scientific teaching model, you can use that effectively when we want to have a discussion. Then we can also use the inductive, deductive approaches in a discussion method of teaching. Then we have the eclectic teaching method. Eclectic. This method of teaching is considered by many to be the best of all teaching methods. This is an assertion, but this assertion is proved to be true from the meaning of the word eclectic. From the word web dictionary. The word eclectic is selecting what seems best of various styles or ideas. So you go to discussion method, you go to lecture method, you go to this method, and you select the best in all this and make a synthesis of that and use that to teach. And educationists have come to agree that if anyone is able to this, do this selecting, picking from styles, from various styles, and then synthesize them to use in teaching, that becomes the best method to, to use. So, a collective teaching combines what is good in other methods of teaching. How then does the teacher go about it? How do you use eclectic teaching methodology? Here it is the teacher one who initiates the activities that are in line with his or her set objectives, which are in line with the topic for the day. Example, the teacher could begin a lesson by posting a picture or pictures on the board, a map or a diagram, and then the learners are requested to look at the picture. We have something some time ago we call picture description. And they are asked to find facts or information. Such activities could be in the following context. Observation. Some of us are not very observant. But observation is an important tool to learn from or use to learn. Comparison. You make a comparison. Some people are colorblind. Some people can do comparison and strike differences. Some people find it difficult to describe description. So in your school days, secondary school days, you, you were taught descriptive essays. Comparison, that is why we were always or sometimes given a debate to compare the pro and the con. Noting down facts Noting is another area. Even at our level, some students still find to make find it difficult to put notes when a lecturer is teaching. They find it difficult to write down notes after the teacher says, "Please give us notes, give us this." They have not trained themselves into getting or being skillful in note taking. Some also lack self-expression. There are some issues a student probably understands, but he finds it difficult to express it. These are areas that we need to look at when we want to use eclectic teaching as a model, as a method. 
So if you want to sum, a credit teaching goes, the method goes through three phases. In the phase one, the teacher leads the learner to do two things. Let me repeat. You choose to use eclectic teaching. I have said that you have chosen to combine the best of all the methods that you know and you want to use these combinations to teach. You need a phase one and in the phase one you need to go through the following two. Discover facts. Let the learners discover facts for themselves. Two. Then you, the teacher, you clear the misconceptions that arise from what they have discovered. That is phase one. Then in phase two, you ask the learners to read through a comprehensive passage ahead of time for discussion. Now you follow it up, you request the learners either to summarize the major highlights of a, the biography of an important personality. I once read the biography of the late Osage Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, and I was surprised in the US when he was working what, at somewhere which looked like a poultry farm, and he became nizotic. And the doctor advised that if he didn't stop working at that factory, his health will be jeopardized. That's a biography. So learners are allowed and initially to share the views of what they have done, their views, their ideas. Then as the lesson progresses, the teacher draws the learner's attention to other important ideas or facts that they overlooked during their reading for facts. So that is the teacher's business in this. As, as learners, they, you realize that they are not able, their minds will overlook some important things that you think they should have known or picked. So you draw their attention to that. And that is the phase two of using eclectic teaching. The learners are given further assignments after you have help them to bring out or you help them that these are some of the things that you, sh you should have noticed. After that, you give them further assignment with specific guidelines. Specific guidelines. In phase three, you do a summary like this. The teacher's ability in phase three, your ability is on the syllabus material and the methods on the needs of the learner. Note that if you want to use a critic and you are combining the best of methods, then you are phase three. Don't forget that your ability to base all that you want to do on your syllabus material and the methods that you have chosen. You are looking at all this in the context of the needs of the learner. Then you, the teacher, must of necessity motivate your learners in two ways. Intrinsic motivation, which you know already, and extrinsic motivation. Where in the intrinsic, you are helping the children to love to learn. Learning particular subjects, topics for its own sake. But in the extrinsic, you make learners to be aware of the benefits to be gained from a subject, from a topic. And if we are able to do this, they have been indirectly, they have become interested. In fact, if you teach a child and the child grows to dislike your subject, you didn't teach the child. You didn't use the eclectic form of teaching. And 
you are children did not go to laugh what you taught. It is because of the methodologies that you used. So you need to be very careful. So the following four questions according to Obanya should guide any teacher who decides to use the eclectic approach to teach. You need to be very clear to ask this. What is to be taught? What am I going to teach the child? What is the topic? What is its relevance to the child? Under what conditions, number two, am I going to teach this topic? What conditions? Now, what is expected of the learners? One, before I start this lesson, what is expected of them during the presentation of this lesson? and then post-teaching. Three, before, during, and after. Then the fourth, what, what combinations of materials and teacher learning activities? Listen to that point carefully. What combinations of materials combinations of teacher learner materials or activities will ensure that I, the teacher, and the learners will be exposed to the type of experience which can change the learner's behavior. And that will be the product for the day. And so when we come to the preparation of lesson plan, we will come to know the product the condition under which the children are to perform and how they are going to be assessed. Very, very important because that will be your objective. So it is advisable for teachers to think through, use their own initiative and resources to combine what is good, what is best, in the various methods that we have gone through to do a presentation, to do your own teaching and make your teaching effectively, lively in the classroom, your children will not want you even to stop when time is up because you are prepared and you are using the best to get across to them. So we summarize our work on methods of teaching and then we will end on methods of teaching to start strategies. We have so far been able to identify and discuss methods of teaching like mass instruction, which is lecture method. On its side, we have discovery, discussion, inductive and deductive, and individualized teaching method. So when we put them into two groups, mass, Instruction lecture stands on one side, which is teacher oriented. The remaining ones are learner oriented. We also found out that all the methods can be used to achieve both, not all, sorry, not all methods that you choose can be used to achieve both lower and higher cognitive objectives. For example, the lecture method is only suitable for the lower levels, understanding, comprehension, and application. It cannot be used to achieve analysis and synthesis. It is also true, we have found out, that inquiry, you can use that. Others can, and, and others combine if you are using inquiry methodology or discovery methodology, it can be used to achieve the higher objectives. Analysis, synthesis, evaluation. And we have also agreed that a combination of the best of all methods that we have talked about will be the best, and that is the eclectic model of teaching. And when we use eclectic, we are using the best of all the methods and educationists all around the globe agree that the eclectic form 
of methodology to teach. It's the best of all methods. Good afternoon once again. And we hope to meet at another time with another topic, specifically techniques or strategies of teaching.